I must tell you something, I'm a physician. And except from dealing with longevity, if you would look how my morning look like the first part of the day, we are dealing with young soldiers who got severe injury, who are referring to us. And also, we are discussing several cases that were referred to us because of the terror attack yesterday. And on one side, we are dealing, we are saying longevity. On, on the other side, we are dealing with young individual and, and the amount and the significance of the injuries is unbelievable. And one of the questions that we ask ourselves every day is which life are worth living? Which is a major question that is relevant also when I'm speaking with aging. And when somebody has a severe injury or life-threatening injury, we usually have two options. Is whether we are going to a path that it's a kind of brain death and then it's clear to us that that we need the organ in order to save other people, or whether we're gonna fight for this individual life. And we find ourselves a lot of time with the young individual willing to take much more, what's that? And we find ourselves with the young individual willing to invest a lot, even though, even though we know that this young individual, we don't have the legs, we not have the legs, somebody will not be able to speak, will not be able to see, but still, but still we are doing that. And if you will have somebody at the age of 18, you will, usually will not fight in the same manner. And when I ask in myself, and this morning we had this, this question, whether this life is worth living, and you ask yourself, what are the life that worth living? The way I think of it is that as long as the information is living, as long as we can process the things that happen around, and as long as we can generate new insight from the information that is coming in, for me, this is life worth, life that worth worthing. And, and you can see people without the hand, without the leg, and, and they're happy once you take them out. And I look from the side, and this is indeed an amazing year. And for today was the extremities. I'm working from one extremities, and now, now I need to speak about longevity. So sorry that I'm speaking with you about that, like, like the shrink. I'm married to a social worker, but I haven't met her now. She, she, I can speak with her a lot, so I'm doing that with you. Nevertheless, we are at longevity conference, and let's assume us all, let me see, where is my lecture? Let's assume that we have, we have the life that are worth living, meaning we have the brain. We can process information, get it inside, we can process it and get, get new insight. So, so how, how can we deal with that? Okay, so what we are speaking about is, is the vehicle, okay, the vehicle. It's not the driver, we have the driver of the car. We speak about the vehicle. And like any car that is coming out of the factory, at the end of the day, the performance of this car will be the balance between regeneration repair mechanism, and that generation. Because once you are out of the factory, you are only going down. From time to time, you can go to the garage, fix things, and then, then you get better. And, and in life, we have, we have two options. Is if you are at the Formula One, you have the option to make a stop at the pit stop before the car is crashing, and fix, replace the tire, fix the engine, fix whatever is needed to be fixed, even though you can take the another one. Or you can go to the garage. I call it is either you're managing your health or you're managing disease. If you're professional, you will go to the pit stop. So let's assume we have this kind of pit stop, human pit stop. What, what the classical thing that will happen in this pit stop? What, what is our wishful thinking? 
We need to trigger a generation. So if I'm coming to the pit stop, I need a trigger. Tell the guys, guys, the car is coming in, be prepared. I want you to start fixing. The other thing, we need, we need the repairs. In the body, it's, it's the stem cells, but we need the repairs. Without the repairs, I can make a stop at the pit stop, nothing will happen. We need energy because any activity that we do is energy demanding. And we need angiogenesis, we need access. Access to the car, access to your tires. These, these are the thing. And let's take it one by one and we can see how we can tackle that. The first thing is, is the trigger. The most powerful trigger that we have in our body that induces regeneration or the repair mechanism is actually hypoxia, is lack of oxygen. Because from evolution perspective, along our evolution, whenever we have hypoxia, there is a damage because this way of living is oxygen dependent. So once we have hypoxia, hypoxia trigger all the repair mechanism, all the things that need to happen while you have injury. And one of the things that's going up is HIF. HIF is a promoter, stands for hypoxic induced factor. Once his HIF is up, there will be a whole cascade of genes that will try, start to express themselves. And, and that's what we need. So you can say, okay, take a person, hold his breath, stop his heartbeat, you will have hypoxia, and then you will induce HIF. Great. But then you have also the injury. And we were thinking what the body actually sends. Does the body sense absolute values or does the body sense the fluctuation? There is no absolute in anything. Everything is relative. I will feel that I'm fortunate or unfortunate, not really on the absolute of what I have, based on what my neighbor has. Okay, we said, let's, let's trick it. Let's take the oxygen to very high level and then do a fast decline back to the normal. And it might be possible that this decline back to the normal will be interpreted as hypoxia at the cellular level, even though we don't have hypoxia. This is what we call the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox, inducing things that happen during hypoxia without the hypoxia. This is how we do, since we are playing with, with gases and pressure, if we want to play with gas, you need an environment. We need to control the environment. For that, we are using what is called hyperbaric oxygen chamber. People are going inside, sitting inside, and we can enjoy ourselves. We can take the oxygen to whatever level that we want, with oxygen, with other, with other gases that we want. This is, this is our playground. So what we are doing, we are taking people inside, they are sitting, we are increasing the pressure to two atta, two atmospheres, we are living in one atmosphere. And then we ask the people to put the mask on. By doing that, we are increasing the blood oxygenation from 100 mercuries to 1600. At this level, the amount of the dissolved oxygen in the blood is sufficient for all the energy demand. So we don't need red blood cells. Oxygen can be delivered either to location when red blood cells cannot go. And then becomes the trick. We ask the people to take the mask off and then on again. And those fluctuation when we are doing that is being interpreted as hypoxia. This is better? Okay. It's being interpreted as hypoxia even though we don't have hypoxia. So this is how it goes. And this is an example with Cell culture, you are taking cell culture, evaluating the HIF, increasing the oxygen for two hours like we are doing. The oxygen, the HIF is going down, of course. But then afterwards, when we are going exactly to the same environment, you can see that the HIF is increasing, even though we are at exactly the same environment that was before. But the interpretation is different. And this is in brain, Okay, that we can see the increase in HIF in the brain, and we can see it in humans and PBMCs that we take, which are nucleated cells, and we can see the increase in HIF when we are doing repeated session. So we have the trigger. Once we have the trigger, all the things that happen in the down cascade will also increase. For example, stem cells, you can see that when we are bringing people to repeated session, we can see the increase in the stem cells. This is human data. Okay, this is not animal data. Of course, you can see it in animal, 
But I think with the aging, we should start with humans and go backwards because we have a lot of proof that the animals that are that model that, are, that we have is not good enough. Okay, but so here you can see that. You can see even mesenchymal stem cells are increasing in a level that we can find them in the circulation. If we have the best plant in the world, if we will put it here, what will happen? Probably not much. It's a desert. Nothing will grow. If we we'll put it on the right side, it will grow. So playing with stem cells in animal models, we have amazing data. However, in humans, the results are not so good. It might be because this is a single injection, but it might be related to the environment. Because usually in animal models, we are causing a damage and then start with the treatment, but the primary cause is out. Unfortunately, in humans, if we don't have repair of the damaged tissue, it means that we have bottlenecks that prevent the tissue from being repaired. And the classical bottleneck is damage to the microcirculation or the macrocirculation. The macrocirculation, we are very good, we can fix it, bypass, tenting, but the microcirculation. And whatever comes after this occlusion, this is a desert. There is not enough oxygen over there. You can take the best plant in the world, put it here, it's a desert. It will not grow. So if we are taking that desert into the hyperbaric environment, so we are increasing the oxygen to a level that oxygen can go by diffusion even to this area, and now you can implant. And then this plant can flourish and grow. So this is the other element. But we don't want people to live in the hyperbaric. So we actually need to generate new blood vessels, what we call angiogenesis. We all know that the body can do, can generate new blood vessels. You can go to the gym, walk out, and then you will see blood vessel generated. So the body can do that. What do we need for angiogenesis? We need a trigger. We have it. We need the energy, we have it, and we need the stem cells, we have it. So we have the three elements needed to generate new blood vessels, and indeed we can see it. In animal models, in mice, rats, we can take the brain out and see it visually by microscope. In humans, unfortunately, we cannot take the brain yet, even though we try every year to make an application. Every January, I'm making a new application, I said I want to take brain biopsies, say, no, 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 no. I said, okay, lawyers, no, 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 no. This time we will try again with the politician and we'll see if it works. So in humans, we are doing perfusion MRI where we can see cerebral blood flow. You can see the before and after, cerebral blood volume. So it's not a direct measure of the blood vessels, but we can see the increase in blood flow, blood volume. So it means that we have a good indication that what we see in animal models actually happens in humans. The last thing, and after speaking after Minovia, <laughs> it's all clear to us that the mitochondria are probably the most important organ in our body, and I mean what I'm saying. And also with regard to cancer, the most important thing is good mitochondrial function because of the Warburg effect, okay? And if you will take mitochondria from normal cell into cancer cell, they will become normal and vice versa. So, that's to give further strength to what you're saying. So mitochondria are highly important. And if we want to play with the mitochondria, we need to understand what is the environment that the mitochondria sends. And actually, all the cascade of this body, from the lungs, to the heart, to the blood vessel, to the small blood vessel, to the intersticium, is actually to deliver to the mitochondria whatever it needs. That's... That's the core of the, all of this machine, okay? When, if it's not there, then there's nothing happen. And this is the oxygen cascade. The target organ of the oxygen is the mitochondria. Now, we as physicians used to measuring the blood oxygenation. It's around 100 mercuries. But the blood oxygenation is, is not relevant if it's not reaching the mitochondria. And even though the blood oxygenation is around 100 mercuries, at the mitochondria level, the amount of oxygen that is being sensed is between one to four mercuries. That's it. That's it. Not more than that. 
And if you are increasing the hemoglobin, I'm also a nephrologist. And what good in nephrology is people don't have kidneys. This is great because you can control everything. If you love physiology, this is the best, the best thing that you can have. You can control everything. You can also control the amount of red blood cells. And we were thinking, since our patients are dying from cardiovascular disease, let's increase the hemoglobin. 16, 17, 18, why not? We will increase the oxygen delivery. We can give more EPO, erythropoietin. Amazing thing happen when we increase it to above 16 or above 14. People die more. I said, what's going on? We are increasing the oxygen delivery. And the reason is, when we are increasing the red blood cells, the viscosity is increasing, but actually what the mitochondria is sensing is not increasing because the mitochondria plays only with the free oxygen in the blood, not with the bind oxygen, only with the dissolved. That's what plays in the mitochondrial gradient. So if you're increasing the hemoglobin level above a certain level, the mitochondria doesn't, doesn't sense it. The opposite, the viscosity is higher. So you're increasing the risk of clotting. So how can we play with, with the dissolved oxygen? And this is the playground that we have. So think about it. When we are going to hyperbaric oxygenized environment, we are playing only with the dissolved oxygen. We have the privilege to play directly on the mitochondria. And by going up and down, up and down, it's just like doing interval training to the mitochondria. Great. And, and there's a lot of data with regard to that. Once you are doing the hyperoxic epoxic or interval training to the mitochondria, then we can see mitochondria proliferation. We can see mitochondria proliferation in, in the muscles. Surprise, surprise, we can see the same in the brain. The brain is a tissue, how surprising it is. And we have also mitochondria. Today there are high resolution that you can see the mitochondria. Caesar from University of California took the protocol that we are doing in humans, and he's working on cell culture of glia and neuronal cell. And with his ability, he was able to demonstrate mitochondrial migration from the glia cell into the neuronal cell. That it's triggered by the fluctuation that we generate. And once the neurons regain this mitochondria, the neuron is more resilient to whatever stress you expose him. So there's a significant animal study, but, but our interest is humans, okay? Because we are humans. So what we are doing, we are doing muscle biopsies, isolating the muscle cells, taking it. We are using the Ouroboros because with this we can generate some standard that that can happen in, when we are not doing all tests the same. And we see that in humans, when we are using the fluctuation in the oxygen and the pressure, we are actually triggering better complex one activity. And, and the amount of ATP that we get per glucose is higher. We can also see mitochondrial proliferation. And this is also human data. We are doing the biopsy and you can see that. This is being reflected by the better VO2 max, by a better anaerobic threshold, by the better muscle that you generate. So, so this, is, this is the tools that we have. This is the pit stop that we have. So it's a good pit stop. But usually in medicine, unfortunately, we are waiting for the catastrophe. We are not making a stop at the pit stop. Once you have catastrophe, you're starting to treat it. You have the legitimacy as a physician to treat it. So there is kind of catastrophe that we dealt with in the morning. War accident, terror effect, etc., etc. But there are some accidents that are age-related accidents, when a tire get, get, get crap. Okay, and, and for example, you can see peripheral vascular disease. It's been reflected as wound. Why do we think that we have diabetic wound in the leg and we not realize that the same is happening in the brain? It's happening in the brain. You can see it here. So this is wounds in the brain, stroke. And we develop a method that we can see the metabolism along with the anatomy in the brain. And there is a scale of injury that you can get. On the one extremity, you have necrosis, meaning that the tissue is totally dead. 
it's been replaced with fluids. Unfortunately, when it's been replaced with fluids, here we cannot regenerate yet because we don't have the infrastructure. We need people like Tal Dvir from the university to generate the infrastructure, hopefully, and then we can build something on that. But we cannot do that. So, so we reflect that as a figure that us physicians, which are not very smart, can see it. So in blue, we mark the necrotic tissue. The necrotic tissue doesn't change. In green, we mark the metabolic dysfunction tissue. And then we can demonstrate that. This is, by the way, ECD being metabolized in the mitochondria of the neurons. So we have a way to see, hopefully, that your technology will also be able to change something in the brain. And that's what it is. We have the mild cognitive impairment, the most common type of cognitive impairment, which happen usually after the age of 65, is related to vascular problem. We see the lesions. This is scars that we see in the brain. It's, it's microinfarcts. That's, that's aging. So when we are using perfusion MRI, you can see the before, you can see the after. That's the way we love it. No discussion. See before, see after. And of course, that's correlate with a better cognitive function because this is what this tissue is doing. But we can do disease care or we can do manage the health. And of course, the appropriate way, if you are professional, if you want to win the race or at least enjoy and get to the end of the race, is, is to actually fix it before it's broken. And we, we have done one of the comprehensive study done on normal aging. We took people at the age of 65 years older, no diabetes, no stroke, no cardiac event, healthy, functioning, non-obese, us at the age of 65 or are older, randomized them into two groups, and we evaluate a lot of parameters. We evaluate the cognitive function, and you can see the improvement. In blue is the treatment, in green it's the control, and that correlates with improvement that we see in the brain tissue because that's what we do. It's not that we are training them in a cognitive performance training. And we can see the same thing happen also in the heart. Okay, we can, with cardiac MRI, we can see the perfusion in the heart, and we can see that the same angiogenesis that we have in the brain happen in the heart. You have better perfusion, better performance of the heart. That's been reflected with a better anaerobic threshold, VO2 max, the power that we generate. And we can see it also in other tissue. This is the penis. This is perfusion MRI of the penis. We can see the blood flow before, blood flow after. And surprisingly, it's correlating, okay? Because it's the same pipes that we have in all of our house. We evaluated also other markers like telomeres, also in humans. We see elongation in telomeres. We can see senescent cell in skin biopsies in people that allowed us to take skin biopsies. Surprisingly, it was only male that allowed us to take skin biopsy. I really don't understand why, because feminism means that we have to work with everything together. And we can see the same angiogenesis when we are doing skin biopsies. Since we are not allowed to take brain biopsies, we are taking skin biopsies. So you can see the angiogenesis in the skin biopsies. We can see more elastic fever and more collagen. So that's, that's what it is. So the main issue that I look at it is, is performance. Longevity, it's a word that we don't know. We don't know how to measure. But performance, it's something that we can measure. We can measure the performance of the brain. We can measure cardiac performance, physical performance, sexual performance. These kinds of things we can measure. We can measure before and after and monitor. And if we are looking along our life journey, there is always a bottleneck to our performance. When we are young, we have amazing biology. However, the bottleneck is the knowledge and the wisdom that we have. In long life, we have more wisdom, more knowledge. However, the biology becomes the bottleneck. So all we need to do is, is to open that bottleneck. And then you have, and then you have a new species. And, and, and this species is people, and this is, this is a classical example for this species. The BBC came to do a story on, on the things that we are doing. And they asked me at the end of taking the picture, where do you think 
the world is going to. I reply, they thought I would say, wow, it's amazing work. We're going into good direction. We're going to hit that. We're going to eliminate that disease, that disease. And I said, terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Ask me why. Because we are generating two species of humans. For example, on this side, you can see Joe Maroon, Dr. Joe Maroon. He's a neurosurgeon, one of the world pronounced neurosurgeon. He, when we started to do what we are doing in the brain and we claim that we have angiogenesis, neurogenesis in the brain, he was calling to me and discussing with him. He said, Shai, this is impossible. It cannot happen, etc., etc." And he was one of the people who got against us and said, Shai, you will not work. However, after he saw some of our study, he came to a clinic, a Viv clinic in Florida, which is affiliated to our clinic. And he decided to take the treatment on himself, and he evaluated everything. The brain, the telomere, the senescent cell, and he did it in, in outside lab. And at the end of the treatment, he told me, this is the most expensive treatment I ever got. I said, why? He said, because now I bought a house near the clinic, and, and I need to be close to it. And here you can see him. He's, he's at the age of 82. After the treatment, he improved his triathlon score by half an hour, 82. He's full active. Now think about Dr. Joe Maroon. I enjoyed discussing with him. He said, you won't believe what I was doing. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know that I used to do frontal lobectomy to patients with psychiatric disorder? Tell me, can you realize how stupid I was? He said, I did that. Take Joe Maroon with the huge amount of knowledge, of wisdom, in a place where he is now, he is still active, still doing research, still treating patients, and take somebody who has just finished medical school. It's not a fair fight. He's so high. Now, worse than that, take Joe Maroon, who take the high end of the science, that we have today and actually practice it. And take this average American over here. It's, it's, it's not the same species. It's absolutely not the same species. And this is the world that we are going to. And everybody needs to choose where he wants to be. Whether he wants to be here or he wants to be here. And as people who are dealing with longevity, in my team, and there are some people in the audience who know my team very good, I always say, practice what you preach. So if we are dealing with longevity, we should practice what we preach. And we should target to be on the right side of the screen. And I don't have time, and I will stop over here. One last thing, this is how hyperbaric looks like. This is the hyperoxic epoxic paradox. It can be done here. Unfortunately, there's a lot of crap going around. People are taking this tube, sucks full of air. They call it hyperbaric chamber. They use my name. This is not legal. This is, doesn't have the quality assurance. It's not the protocol. It's not anything. But we are living in a fake world, so this is not it. Thank you very much, and I will make a stop over here.